Uh, okay, so first of all, let me thank all of you for being here today. And special thanks to the jury members, of course, who have connected uh, from all over the world. And uh, I'm truly honored to discuss my work in front of such an awesome group of scientists. So thank you all for your time. And of course, I would like to thank my supervisor, Pierre and Jacqueline, for convincing the jury members to check out my work today. Uh, so many thanks to all of you. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, The Role of Progress-Based Intrinsic Motivation in Human Learning. Uh, and before diving into the nitty gritty of my work, let me ask you to take a moment to reflect on uh, these two images here. Uh, at a first glance, the baby and the robot do not have uh, very much in common. But what they do share, however, is a need to master their bodies and to explore the world around them. Uh, and this is no coincidence, of course. Uh, while we're not sure exactly what babies uh, are up to when they're learning about the world, we know precisely what this robot does. Uh, in fact, this robot was used in our lab to explore various ideas about the computations that uh, little baby brains might carry out when uh, they are learning about the world. And uh, my own work adopts a similar approach in that it draws inspiration from models uh, developed in AI in order to explore ideas about human learning. Uh, let me now give you a better impression of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, the main buzzword of my talk is uh, learning, but uh, to be more specific, uh, I'll talk primarily about a certain subset of learning processes called active learning. Uh, in which uh, the learner exerts control over what to learn. And uh, as you may know, active learning can be extrinsically or intrinsically motivated. And uh, I believe this distinction should be fairly familiar to most of you. For now, I'll just say that when learning is extrinsically motivated, its value derives from a separable outcome or a goal. And in contrast, when someone is intrinsically motivated, they learn because uh, learning itself is somehow uh, pleasurable for them. However, there's an, uh, another distinction that I need to introduce. Um, a lot of research, especially in psychology and neuroscience is focused uh, on the so-called information seeking, which refers to an active search uh, for a specific piece of information. And uh, this kind of active learning is usually studied in the context of a fixed task, uh, which is familiar to the participant. However, the scenario we are mostly interested in is rather different. Uh, so, we know that humans, uh, especially children, face the challenge of not only seeking specific information for familiar tasks, uh, but also exploring the space of uh, potential tasks out there. So the work I'll be presenting today concerns the computational mechanisms of intrinsically motivated exploration in human active learning. Uh, so yeah, this, this little region here. Um, so before diving into the mechanisms, it helps to first consider the, the functions uh, and according to several accounts, the primary adaptive function of intrinsic motivation is to support autonomous acquisition of generalizable knowledge. Uh, and this, by the way, includes uh, skills. And uh, note that such knowledge is useful when the learner is immersed in a highly variable environment. And arguably, this is very much uh, the case for humans. And what this implies is that intrinsic motivation is there to not only develop specific, a specific set of competences, but also to diversify it. Um, so this idea exposes two salient computational challenges that a system of intrinsic motivation must solve in order to be adaptive. Uh, the system must be able to sample and practice different tasks without knowing what will be useful in the future. Uh, and part of this challenge lies in the practically infinite amount of tasks that learners can generate and pursue. And this suggests that uh, a successful intrinsic motivation system should be able to somehow constrain the task selection process and make it efficient. Uh, and I should say, uh, by the way, that uh, I'm using the word task here rather abstractly. Uh, so the task, a task can refer to anything uh, from uh, goal state to prediction or perceptual inference, for example. So another challenge is that the space of potential tasks is not only large, but also contains tasks that are conceivable, but uh, somehow impossible for the learners to achieve. Um, and learners that generate and pursue their own tasks should avoid wasting their time trying to do something that, is, uh, that cannot be done. So to summarize, a successful system of intrinsic motivation must somehow optimize task selection in the conditions of various tasks that may or may not be uh, doable. Um, 
A few people have endorsed the idea that intrinsic motivation for exploration could be based on uh, learning progress signals generated by uh, tracking one's own behavior. And uh, as I'll explain in a bit, learning progress based motivation has shown several attractive features in simulated settings. Uh, but before going there, let me uh, just quickly explain how it works at a relatively high level. Uh, so we have an agent uh, that features two distinct modules. Uh, one module, which we can call the learner, is the one that learns to perform tasks in the world. And more specifically, the world provides uh, some context in which the learner tries to perform a given task by taking actions in the world and observing their effects, and thereby adjusting its future responses. And uh, as you may recognize, this is a fairly standard reinforcement learning setting. However, in our system, the consequences of the learner's actions are also picked up by the second module, which we can call the meta module. Uh, and the job of the meta module is to sample tasks from the task space and feed them to the learner. And uh, in a system driven by LP or learning progress, the, the meta module computes progress by observing and modeling how the learner performs on a given task over time. Uh, and just as an example, uh, it can compare how, uh, how it expects to perform on a given task uh, to how it actually performs and then update uh, the LP value for this task. Uh, uh, and by doing that, the agent can explore the task space efficiently by sampling tasks according to LP. So <clears throat> here's why a, a system like this is expected to be efficient. Uh, we can consider a setting with uh, four different tasks that all have unique uh, learnability profiles, which we can represent as uh, different learning curves. So uh, one task in this set is already learned or, or familiar. So uh, the competence on this task uh, is high from the beginning. Another task is not learned, but it, it's very easy to learn. So the competence increases quickly with time or with practice. Uh, the third task is similar but harder, and uh, the fourth task is completely impossible for the learner to, to do. Uh, so an LP-driven system would favor different tasks at different points in time. Um, for example, it would tend to select the easy task first, uh, and then as the performance on that task starts to level off, so right about here, it, it would shift its focus on the hard task, uh, on the harder task. Uh, and note that at no point in time uh, does the system waste uh, its uh, resources on something that's already learned or something that's uh, impossible to learn. And this is what makes uh, uh, this intrinsic motivation so efficient. Um, so does this work in practice? Uh, in fact, it works pretty much as expected. Uh, so uh, in a relatively recent study by a former PhD student from our lab, a robotic arm agent called Curious was equipped with an NLP-based uh, intrinsic motivation and tested in a multiple task setting with distractors. So some tasks in the study were easier than others. Uh, the easiest task was to reach uh, an arbitrary point in space with a gripper. Uh, a slightly more challenging task was to push a block on the table to a target location. Then there was a pick and place task, which uh, required the agent to pick up a block and then position it uh, at an arbitrary uh, location in space. And finally, there was a stack task, which required the agent to stack one block on top of another. Um, so just as expected, the agent learned to reach first and then uh, to push uh, and then to pick up blocks and place them where it wanted to. Uh, so uh, this learning cur curriculum emerged by following LP. Uh, which peaked uh, at different points in time for different tasks. Uh, and note that the emergence of this curriculum was completely unfazed by adding three distractor tasks involving the, the little purple blocks uh, that were too far to reach for, for the agent. Um, so as this simulation study shows, progress-based exploration enables artificial learners to acquire progressively more complex skills. And uh, this is very reminiscent of how <clears throat> babies learn to control their bodies. Uh, for example, before they can ever crawl, they need to learn how to turn over. Before they, and before they can do that, they need to learn how to get their arms, legs, and head in, in a correct position. So noting these similarities, Kaplan and Udiye proposed that uh, human intrinsic motivation could also be guided by learning progress. And this idea is known as the learning progress hypothesis. So if human motivation is indeed sensitive to learning progress, we can expect to see several things. Uh, for one, 
We can expect people to prefer tasks that are not too easy and not too difficult. Uh, we can expect uh, task engagement to depend to some extent on people's evolving competence on the task. Uh, and finally, uh, following an LP-based strategy should be more beneficial for learning uh, compared to other non-random exploration strategies. Uh, so there are several empirical studies that are actually compatible, compatible with these predictions, but as we shall see, they do not really address the learning progress hypothesis uh, very directly. Uh, one study by Gherkin et al, uh, uh, the authors compared how long infants would listen to two sets of stimuli consisting of different inflections of Russian words. So one set of words uh, contained salient regularities, which made learning uh, a general grammatical rule easier. And another set of words uh, uh, did not have these regularities, so it was impossible for uh, children to pick up the rule. Uh, and the authors in this uh, study found that uh, infants listen to words from the unlearnable set uh, less compared to uh, the learnable set. In another study by Baranis et al., uh, adult participants were given a set of 64 uh, sensory motor games to, to explore freely. Uh, so the games were actually different difficulty levels of the same game, which required uh, players to press a button when a dot, a moving dot intersected uh, a line, kind of like in a Guitar Hero game, uh, if you're familiar. Um, so most participants uh, sampled both the hardest and the easiest games, but they spent the majority of their time playing games that were neither too easy nor too hard, so somewhere in the middle. Uh, and finally, in a recent study by uh, Poli and colleagues, infants were, were presented with a stochastic, with stochastic sequences in which a visual target, uh, this green thing, appeared in one of four different locations. Um, so uh, the authors introduced a probabilistic cognitive model to formally express uh, learning progress from the perspective of the learner. Uh, so the way it worked is that throughout the, a sequence, the model updated its expectations for where the target might appear next. Uh, and then LP was defined as the amount of change in model predictions from one update to the next. And uh, the authors of the study showed that uh, this form of LP predicted how long infants uh, looked at, at, at the sequences. Uh, of course, there are more studies related to the learning progress hypothesis, but the ones presented here already illustrate uh, some gaps in past research uh, uh, in terms of how directly they, they uh, address the learning progress hypothesis. For instance, uh, the Gherkin et al. study did not really provide an explicit measure of learning progress because they measured uh, stimulus complexity instead. Uh, and also, uh, infants in their study did not get an opportunity to actively choose tasks for themselves. So they were given a task, and then the researchers looked at how long they would engage in it. Um, in the study by Baranis et al., they did uh, study active sampling of tasks, but they never measured learning progress on these tasks. Uh, and uh, in the last study by Poli et al., uh, they provide an interesting measure of OP, but again, they, they don't really give uh, uh, their participants an opportunity to actively sample uh, from a multiple uh, from multi from a set of multiple tasks. Um, so to address these gaps, we introduced a novel paradigm uh, which combines several elements of the previous work in order to study how LP relates to free exploration of multiple tasks. And uh, with this study, we set out to gain some insight into the following questions. Uh, how do people organize their own exploration of various activities in a non-instrumental uh, setting? Uh, would people spontaneously set learning goals in the absence of external instruction? Um, and can LP explain uh, active engagement in learning activities? So to address these questions, we introduced a behavioral task in which participants could freely explore a set of learning activities disguised as a guess, uh, as guessing games where you could offer a cartoon monster character a food item and then see if they liked it or not. Uh, the games were, were played across multiple trials and on each trial, the participant chose an activity, uh, chose what they wanted to play, and then they provided uh, their response. Uh, they would then receive feedback and then this continued for a number of trials. So uh, from the perspective of, of the participant, it would look something like this. So you would be prompted to choose an activity out of four available ones. Uh, then let's say you would choose the squid family, and then you would be given a randomly sampled uh, 
individual from that family, and then you would be required to uh, guess what, what it likes to eat. You provide a guess, uh, then you go on to the next trial. Let's say now you are interested in, in this one. Uh, you would see another, a new monster from that family. You would guess. Uh, of course, nothing stops a participant to choose the same uh, monster family again. And uh, now you can see, now you see another uh, individual from the family, you provide a guess and, and so on and so forth. So you would learn uh, food preferences by trial and error uh, like this. So before letting the participants play the toss, uh, each monster family was randomly assigned to a unique difficulty level here represented by, by the stars. Uh, and the difficulty was, uh, uh, controlled by the corresponding categorization rules of different uh, complexity. So in the easiest tasks, in the easiest rule, sorry, uh, which we call A1, uh, the uh, stimuli varied along a single dimension and a single category boundary determined the, the food preferences. So in practice, it could look something like this. Uh, uh, for example, all the all the all the tall monsters would prefer one one type of food, and all the shorter monsters would prefer something else. Uh, in the next rule, the monsters vary along two orthogonal dimensions. However, only one dimension could be ignored. Uh, sorry, one dimension could be completely ignored uh, because it did not predict food preferences. Uh, so, in practice, it would look something like this. Uh, so the monsters here uh, vary in height and width, but you would only need to attend to their height, for example, if you wanted to predict their, their preferences. So the width was irrelevant. Uh, in the next uh, rule, uh, it, it was in fact the hardest learnable rule in the uh, task set. So individuals here vary also like two orthogonal dimensions, but now both of the dimensions were uh, important for predicting food preferences. And uh, finally, there was also a, a distractor task. Uh, again, the monsters vary along two dimensions, but uh, here, every time a participant guessed the food preferences, the computer would randomly generate uh, feedback. So this task was, uh, uh, in fact, unlearnable. Uh, and uh, importantly, the, the participants were blind to both the rules and how they were assigned. So they, they could only discover it by playing the games. Uh, so yeah, to, to see whether people would spontaneously decide to learn to predict food preferences across all activities, we randomly divided them into two groups. Uh, the groups uh, only differed in the instru instructions that were received. There was a, an external group or EG uh, uh, who were explicitly asked to maximize learning across all monster families by playing 250 trials. Uh, and to make sure they follow this instruction, we also told these participants that they would be tested at the end of the experiment. There was also the uh, internal goal group or IG, which uh, uh, was simply told that uh, they would see different games and that in each game they could guess food preferences from, from how the monsters looked. But other than that, we uh, did not give this group of uh, participants any specific directives uh, for what to do or, or how to behave. Um, and I should point out that uh, performance did not affect how much people were paid. So all participants were paid the same regardless of how uh, well they learned. And this makes uh, our setting now instrumental. Um, and since we expected the behavior of the IG group to vary considerably, the, the, the EG group kind of served as a, as a behavioral ba baseline demonstrating what people do when they try to learn as much as possible. So both groups went through the same exact procedure. Um, the task began with the familiarization stage, which included four blocks of 15 trials uh, on each activity. Uh, and the order of the blocks, of course, was randomized across participants. Uh, that way, we ensured that all people in our experiments were equally familiar with all learning activities before they started to explore them. Uh, and after familiarization, participants had 250 trials to freely explore the games, as I showed uh, before. Uh, and finally, following this free exploration stage, we asked people to rate the activities uh, for things like their interestingness, learnability, complexity, and more. Uh, so I'm not going to present the analysis involving these questionnaires now, but uh, I would be happy to discuss them after the, the presentation is over. So let me now go over the results from this study. Uh, the first thing we wanted to look at is to compare how people in the, uh, in the two groups sample the activities. 
For this, we plotted uh, how many people chose each activity on each trial of free exploration. And this was done separately for the EG group and for the IG group. Um, and as the plots show, uh, the two groups uh, sampled activities quite differently. Uh, specifically, the EG group was more likely to sample the unsolvable activity, especially uh, towards the end of the, uh, the, the task. Uh, and in contrast, the IG group showed more uh, a more uniform sort of uh, distribution uh, of participants across the activities. However, there was uh, a slight preference for oh, sorry, for the easiest activity. Uh, and please note that these are group level proportions that individuals uh, and actually individuals varied a lot in how they uh, sample the activities within groups. Uh, so. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the EG group demonstrated a better overall learning, uh, which was evident from the comparison of uh, final uh, performance scores defined as the difficulty weighted percent correct, which combined like uh, accuracies across all three learnable activities. However, I think the most interesting part of uh, this figure is the substantial overlap uh, in the final performance between the two groups, which suggests that uh, quite a few people in the IG group were actually motivated to learn. Um, so to investigate this finding further, we counted the number of activities that each participant mastered during the during free play. Um, and an activity was considered to be mastered if uh, a participant uh, showed at least 80% accuracy in any a continuous streak of 15 consecutive trials. Uh, so we use this uh, uh, scheme to, to label participants according to how many tasks they've mastered, one, two, or three. Uh, and then we counted uh, uh, each, each uh, level of mastery in, in each instruction group. So as shown on this plot, around 30% of participants in the IG group uh, maximize their learning in the task even though they were not asked to do that. And uh, interestingly, mastering all three tasks in the IG group could be attributed to their selection strategy. And to show this, we plotted how much time on average participants in different groups spent on each activity. So as shown uh, in this panel, the IG participants who mastered all three uh, tasks sampled activities similarly to how uh, EG participants did it. And if you look across the three panels, uh, the good learners of the IG group were kind of unique in how they sampled the tasks, right? So they gave preference to the harder tasks instead of uh, focusing on the easy tasks. Uh, so to summarize this uh, set of results, uh, a significant proportion of participants uh, have behaved as if they wanted to maximize their learning, even though uh, they were not instructed to do so. Uh, and this provides some indirect support to the learning progress hypothesis. However, these results did not directly uh, show if people's activity choices were driven by LP or not. Uh, and in fact, as you can see uh, on this panel, again, uh, successful learners spent most of the time uh, sampling the unlearnable activity, which is not very consistent with the, with the predictions. And this is something I'll discuss more at the end of my presentation. So, uh, but to investigate uh, the role of LP in active task selection more directly, we introduced a computational model of uh, trial by trial choices of learning activities. Um, so the model assumes that the probability of choosing a particular activity at time t depends on uh, one's uh, subjective utility uh, that one attributes to, to each activity. Uh, the subjective utility of each alternative was defined as a weighted sum of two uh, quantities. Uh, one was percent correct uh, or PC and the other one is learning progress or LP. So the subjectivity of this utility function is captured by the weight parameters WPC and WLP that determine how much each component, component contributes to the overall choice utility. Uh, PC and OP were calculated using these formulas, which might look uh, a bit compl uh, complicated, but uh, this is actually easy to understand. For example, uh, we computed PC by uh, first concatenating all the trials on the same activity, uh, and then uh, sort of launching a moving window that com computed uh, accuracy within, uh, within itself. So uh, 
uh, for this trial here, PC would be computed as uh, the proportion of correct trials in that uh, window of 15 trials. Uh, and here it's eight out of 15. Uh, for LP, we did something similar, but uh, we subdivided the same uh, window uh, of trials into two sub windows, and then we computed PC in each window. Uh, and then uh, we took an absolute difference of uh, these scores to, to get uh, kind of an estimate of a temporal derivative of, of uh, PC. Uh, so the idea of taking the absolute difference comes from computational work cited below. Uh, this formulation allows the model to get interested in tasks on which performance can not only improve, but also get worse, which helps to learn the, the overall task space uh, better. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I would love to uh, give you more details uh, uh, on how we fitted the coefficient, but for the sake of brevity, I will just say that uh, uh, using this model formulation, uh, and uh, with the help of maximum likelihood estimation, we inferred how much participants valued PC or LP during task selection. Um, yeah, uh, so using our definition of choice utility as a linear combination of multiple components allowed us to compare models that included uh, either only PC or only LP, or, or maybe both of, the, both of these components. Uh, and the model comparisons based on the AAC criterion show that using the bivariate model provided better fit uh, on average uh, to the data compared to the univariate models. Uh, so by the way, here, uh, lower AAC values correspond to better fit. Uh, so we also conducted a similar analysis using an additional familiarity component. Here we label it as EXP, standing for experience. Uh, and we saw that both PC and LP were still important in accounting for task choices, uh, even when this familiarity component was included. But as we discussed in the paper presenting this work, the familiarity component has some problems with the interpretation, which is why we still consider the bivariate model to explain our data uh, the best. Um, so uh, we then use these, th these fitted weight coefficients from, from the bivariate models uh, to compare uh, different exploration strategies. So specifically, we used the fitted coefficients to isolate two, group of, two groups of participants, uh, those who were driven primarily by PC and those who were driven primarily by LP. Uh, I can explain the details of, fil of this filtering procedure later, but what matters here is that we identified two separate exploration strategies from the fitted coefficients. Uh, we then looked at how uh, these groups of people sampled activities uh, over time. And as you can see on the right plot, uh, people who were LP driven um, spent less time on the unlearnable activity, especially in the IG group, uh, compared to those who were driven by only PC. And note the, the differences in the y axis uh, scales here. So, to see how this uh, unfolded over time, we plotted the average preferences for activity A4 versus activity A3 uh, over time. And as you can see uh, around uh, this trial here, uh, uh, the LP driven group seems to have recognized that uh, one task was not uh, very learnable and they uh, switched attention to, to the more learnable task. Um, well, they spent less time, uh, I should say, uh, on the unlearnable task uh, compared to the PC driven participants. Uh, and this uh, helped uh, this group to achieve overall a better accuracy at the end, even though they started at a, at a kind of a disadvantage in the beginning. <clears throat> so, in sum, the study accomplishes several things. Uh, we show that some people pursue learning goals even though they don't have to, uh, so spontaneously. Um, we also showed that a combination of PC and LP explains task selection in active exploration. And the fact that the bivariate model fitted the observed data better suggests that uh, competence and progress might play separate roles in active exploration and perhaps Competence judgments help us identify novel tasks, while LP helps us to avoid tasks that are unlearnable. Finally, we introduced uh, what I believe is a powerful free choice paradigm that captures how active exploration and learning unfold together over time. 
Uh, and I believe that uh, this task can be used uh, for future research for testing multiple hypotheses about intrinsic motivation, uh, the intrinsic motivation to learn. And it can also be used, uh, uh, it can also be extended to uh, new populations, for example, and new uh, different sets of learning activities to uh, study new hypotheses. Uh, but one direction uh, to follow up on, which I find especially intriguing, is to understand more precisely the process of how LP representations form and how they influence motivation. Uh, in this study, we investigated how these processes uh, uh, work to a relatively limited extent, but uh, in my follow-up work, which I'm presenting next, uh, uh, and which is still very much in progress, uh, we aim to fill in some of the gaps. So let me explain what I mean by these uh, gaps in more detail. So, so far we have assumed that a particular monitoring computation represents things like uh, PC and LP, which can influence the motivation to engage in a task, uh, resulting in some, some observable performance that can be further evaluated and so on and so forth. However, what this diagram seems to be missing is, uh, I think, at least two things. Uh, first, it is important to note that uh, Things like PC and uh, LP could be represented consciously as beliefs or judgments. Uh, and uh, speaking from just personal experience, when I'm engaged in a learning activity, I usually have an idea of how good I am or whether I'm making progress or not, or whether I should keep going or, or give it up. Um, and to me, this, this conscious beliefs, uh, I think play a significant role in my motivation. Uh, but the study presented just, just now does not really explain how LP and PC relate to such uh, beliefs. And second, we didn't pay a lot of attention to uh, how PC and LP might be computed more precisely. Uh, we assumed uh, that, uh, for example, hit rate corresponds to subjective competence and that its temporal derivative, derivative corresponds to LP, but it is possible that people actually assess knowledge and knowledge improvement differently. So I think it's important to study more thoroughly the, the metacognition uh, processes of ongoing performance, especially considering that uh, human metacognition uh, often has uh, systematic errors and not, it's not always accurate. <clears throat> so next I will present to you some of the early steps towards understanding how learning and motivations, motivation interact. Uh, I will present to you another experimental paradigm that hopefully captures the co-evolution of learning, beliefs, uh, motivation, and things like that. Uh, so the study aims to address questions like, uh, are people aware of progress as they are learning an activity or can they track their LP uh, while learning? Uh, if they are, how could uh, these, these explicit LP judgments form? Uh, also, we're interested in how these judgments affect other explicit beliefs about the task and uh, how uh, such beliefs can influence our conscious motivation to practice. Uh, so we have collected some in in interesting data using this paradigm that I'm going to present, but I would like to make a full disclaimer right now and note that the results I'll present uh, later are very inconclusive and exploratory, so please take them with a grain of salt. Um, <clears throat> So our approach was to use a naturalistic task that people might encounter and actually do in real life. Uh, for this, we implemented our version of a famous arcade video game called Lunar Lander, uh, where the goal is to land uh, your spacecraft on the, on the platform. Uh, so the game features the, the spacecraft, which can be controlled with three uh, actions, uh, including clockwise rotation, counterclockwise rotation, and forward acceleration. Uh, and again, the goal is to land the spaceship very carefully on the on the platform, which is tricky to do because there's gravity in this in this game, and uh, it pulls you down. And if you you land the vehicle with too sorry the, the spacecraft with too uh, much momentum, it's going to crash. Uh, so to make the practice process more realistic, we asked participants to practice our game across three different sessions, and the the three different sessions were. Uh, spread across three days. Uh, the first session was played on day one, uh, the second session was played on day two, and the third session was played on day five, so three days later. Um, and I think this makes the, the, the process somewhat more realistic because playing the game is can be interrupted by your like, other daily activities. Um, so it's, I guess, closer to how you would 
practice something like this in real life. Um, each session had the same structure. Uh, so each session started with a 10 to 15 minute uh, game practice, uh, followed by a questionnaire uh, asking people various questions about their motivation and learning related beliefs. And then uh, the session ended with a, a free choice task in which participants were told that they could practice some more if they wanted, but they didn't have to. So this allowed us to observe the behavior of like the behavior of uh, demonstrating intrinsic motivation in action rather than just a, a verbal report. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I won't have time to show you the analysis of this last part of the free choice part of the experiments, but uh, I will be happy to talk about it after the presentation again. Uh, but to summarize the procedure so far, we'll let people to engage in a time extended learning activity. And then uh, as they are uh, learning, we interrogate them about their uh, beliefs about the activity. So one crucial part of the of the task uh, or of the paradigm is to measure the subjective judgments of progress. Uh, for that, we use the semantic differentiation scale uh, like this one. Uh, however, uh, measuring subjective progress is not as easy as it may seem, precisely because it's a very subjective evaluation. So. Uh, for one person, progress might mean something like performing better now compared to 10 minutes ago when I started practice. And to another, it might mean improving since the very first encounter with the task. So to account for these uh, subjectivity, we asked people to evaluate progress uh, for specific time windows. Um, concretely, uh, after the very first practice session, we asked people to uh, compare their current level of performance to how they thought they did in the beginning of the session. And then on the second uh, day, uh, we asked people the same question, but also to compare their performance on the session that just concluded with the previous session. And as you may have guessed on the last session, we asked both of these questions, but also uh, to compare their uh, session that concluded just now with the very first session. Uh, and we'll label these judgments as recent, short-term, and long-term, uh, respectively. And uh, as you can see, all of these judgments ask people to compare their current level of performance to their past performance. So these uh, can also be called retrospective judgments. However, LP is sometimes conceived as, a, as the expected future improvement on the task. And therefore, on every session, we also ask people to evaluate how much uh, they thought they would improve after an additional uh, session of practice. And uh, yeah, this, this kind of judgment can be called the prospective learning progress judgment. So another crucial part of the study was to get people's reports about their motivation and learning beliefs. Uh, thank you, thankfully for that, we had uh, some empirically validated tools available for us, uh, to us. So one of them was the situational intrinsic motivation scale, which measures different aspects of motivation like uh, a motivation, external regulation, identified regulation, and uh, intrinsic motivation. <clears throat> and yeah, another tool that the uh, that we use was the motivated strategies for learning questionnaire, or MSLQ. Uh, this one features many different subscales, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that can be administrated uh, administered uh, separately. But for our study, we were interested in only four of them, uh, specifically the, the extrinsic goal orientation scale, um, the task value scale, control of learning beliefs, and the self-efficacy for learning and performance. Uh, I, I will go back to what each of these scales mean when we need to discuss them. Uh, so let me now share with you some of the results from the study. Uh, as you will see, they are all correlational and exploratory. Uh, so also many participants dropped out from the second and the third session of our task. And that was due to like technical errors of uh, us failing to send them notifications uh, appropriately. Uh, so we did not get as much data for the study as we wished for. Um, so having said that, please keep in mind that while the results I will present to you might be uh, intriguing and interesting, and I do find them intriguing, the interpretation is uh, rather speculative. So first, uh, we looked at whether recent LP judgments uh, correlated with the actual changes in performance within sessions. And just to remind you, these, were, these judgments were comparing uh, the current level of performance with the performance at the beginning of the session. So it's a within session judgment. 
Uh, and what we found is that these subjective progress judgments correlated significantly with the actual differences in success rates. And this demonstrates that people do use success rate information to compute uh, learning progress. However, uh, to me, the most interesting thing about this plot is the unexplained variation along this line here. Um, yeah, uh, what this variation shows is that people can feel progress even when their measured performance stays the same. Uh, and this was even true for people who failed to succeed even once in a session. Um, yeah. What, what, what this result suggests uh, quite strongly, I think, is that uh, success rate is not the only cue for progress estimation. And uh, it poses uh, some interesting questions for future research as to what people, what information might people use to evaluate their subjective learning progress. So I will skip over this part to save time. Here I just show that uh, objective and subjective improvement judgments were also correlated for longer time windows. But as you can see, we, we have uh, much less data for this you know, for these results. So yeah, so next we looked at the, rela uh, the relationship between uh, objective success rate differences and the uh, prospective improvement judgments. So here we found no reliable correlation. Um, and this is interesting because prospective judgments uh, did correlate with the, retros with the recent retrospective judgment. Uh, and from this set of results, it it's interesting to think about the potential, uh, although not very detailed mechanism in which uh, objective success rate dynamics together uh, with uh, some other factors, they might influence retrospective judgments and then uh, retrospective judgments in turn with additional factors, again, uh, influence people's perspective uh, judgments of learning. <clears throat> so for the last set of results from this study, uh, we wanted to explore how objective and subjective measures of progress could relate to the measures of motivation and learning beliefs from the SIMS and MSLQ questionnaires. So we looked at the correlations between different measures of progress in our study, and there were quite a few of them. Uh, and the eight motivation and learning belief measures from uh, SIMS and MSLQ. So while there are quite a few things that uh, we can discuss about this correlation matrix, uh, for now, I would like to focus on only three columns. Uh, the first uh, column is this one. Uh, uh, so as we can see here, uh, reported intrinsic motivation did not correlate so well with different measures of progress. Uh, and at best, it seems like intrinsic motivation seems to be very weakly correlated with the uh, subjective or objective progress measures. On the other hand, however, uh, measures of progress were more strongly and more reliably associated with learning beliefs, such as the belief that the task is uh, learnable with practice and uh, the belief that the task will eventually be learned uh, by, the, by the learner. Uh, and most interestingly, these measures were very strongly correlated with uh, all measures from the SIMS questionnaire, including intrinsic motivation. Uh, which suggests that people that LP could affect people's motivation indirectly by updating uh, appropriate beliefs. Um, yeah. So this last set of results uh, allows us to speculate on what lies in this gap between LP and motivation, um, and to also to connect uh, the learning progress hypothesis to other influential theories in psychology. For example, LP uh, can strengthen a belief that uh, one can improve on a task if one puts in the work. Um, and this kind of belief resonates uh, a lot with the concept of uh, growth mindset popularized by uh, Carol Dweck. Uh, also, LP can reinforce the belief that one will eventually get better on a task. And competence expectations like these are important in the self-efficacy theory uh, by Albert Mandura. And it has also, it, it has been uh, recently theorized by uh, a paper uh, by Blaine and Charat that uh, uh, gains in self-efficacy might function, might function as intrinsic rewards uh, in learning. <clears throat> so let me now step back a little and reflect on what I've presented uh, from a wider angle. Uh, if I had to summarize all of our results in one sentence, I'd have to, I'd say that uh, we, fail to find evidence against uh, the learning progress hypothesis. 
However, some of the observations uh, may not uh, sit so, so well with the, the predictions that I've uh, outlined earlier. So first, we saw that many people in the monster study uh, oversampled the impossible or random activity. Also, one might point out that LP was not the only variable explaining activity choices and that it was actually worse on average when considered uh, alone uh, compared to a model with uh, only PC, for example. Uh, and finally, one could also take issue with uh, the observation from the Lunar Lander study that different measures of progress did not seem to correlate consistently with uh, intrinsic motivation, although some of them uh, did. Uh, so how can we interpret these sort of inconvenient observations? Uh, one possibility is that uh, the learning progress hypothesis is wrong. And uh, it was somewhat disconcerting to think about this at first, but I guess it wouldn't be so bad for, for, for the scientific progress overall. I would say uh, that ruling out the uh, learning progress hypothesis completely would be as good uh, as somehow proving it right. And in fact, this highlights a very important kind of question that uh, I think all scientists need to ask from time to time, but that we maybe sometimes forget. And that's uh, uh, the question is what kind of evidence would completely discredit uh, the learning progress hypothesis? And uh, to be frank, I don't have like a really good answer myself, and perhaps you could suggest some, some interesting ideas today. Uh, however, I do not think that these findings show that the, the learning progress hypothesis is wrong, in fact. Uh, and in, this is in part because there are a couple of other plausible explanations for what we see. Um, for example, it might be the case that people are not very good at estimating progress uh, or even uh, their competence or knowledge on, on, a, on a particular task. So someone uh, might pursue an impossible uh, activity because they are, uh, oh, sorry, someone might pursue an impossible activity because they are fooled to think that uh, they are getting better when they are not. And yeah, this raises uh, a need uh, to be able to assess the metacognitive accuracy of progress judgments, uh, which is not so simple uh, because defining LP itself is kind of tricky. For example, we could simply ask people if they feel like they are making progress on a task or not, but then it would be difficult to know how accurate their answers are because we wouldn't know uh, what to compare them to. And on the other hand, we could start from uh, defining LP objectively, um, but then it would be difficult to uh, justify that this objective definition corresponds to what people are actually like, doing when they're evaluating progress. So in other words, it is difficult uh, to know if, uh, oh, sorry. in other words, it, it, it is difficult to know that uh, if people's metacognition is wrong or if it's our ideas about their metacognition uh, are wrong. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually related to another potential explanation, explanations for the ob observations above. So uh, people could have tried to achieve something that we did not expect them to. Uh, for example, in the task with uh, monsters, perhaps people oversampled the impossible activity, not because they were fooled to think that it was solvable, but because they suspected that it was unsolvable, and then they tried to verify uh, the suspicion. So then, even if they, uh, their performance on this activity stayed the same, so no LP, uh, according to our definition, their knowledge about this task would actually improve with each additional trial, right? They, they would be more and more convinced that the trial is unlearnable, uh, that the task is unlearnable. And a similar concern can be raised for a lunar lander task. Uh, as I've previously suggested, uh, landing the lander is not the only uh, is not the only indicator of success in the game, uh, at least subjectively. So people might keep track of how well they think they control the lander, for example, or uh, maybe they track their subjective effort in the task or some some unknown measure of uh, goal proximity. And uh, what this all points out to, I think, is uh, the need to understand how people represent tasks and how they decide what counts as good performance on these tasks. Um, and I think these are all like exciting directions that uh, I hope you can uh, appreciate. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank all of you for listening. And I hope you've uh, made some learning progress in the process, and, uh, or at the very least, that you think that you did. 
Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm ready to take the questions. So thank you very much.